OK, we've looked at sediments and we've looked at layers, but as important as a layer is the, the interface, the, the, the boundary, the surface, uh, the surface of a layer or the boundary between layers. Um, now, this might be, the boundary between layers might be an abrupt boundary or it might be a gradual change in the character of sediments. You can often tell when you're coming down, when you're digging, when you're coming down to a layer boundary, if the, if the uh, buried layer is quite distinctive in terms of colour, you might start to get just a little bit of grain mottling as you approach the grain boundary, because invertebrates do move fine sediment around. They can often move fine sediment around without, without totally disturbing or mixing the site, but you can often get a little bit of warning that you're coming down to a layer boundary. At Prudgeo we found this, two or three centimetres above the layer boundary, we started to get a little speckling of red sand. The ants were moving up a little bit of that Pleistocene red deposit. Interfaces. Ian Davidson once uh, quite nicely said that in most sites there's more gap than sequence. So interface, uh, you, you need to give some consideration to the gap, to the interfaces. Now interfaces between layers might be a change in the character of the sediment or the net sediment budget. You know, so you, suddenly you've got a very different sort of material entering the site and being laid down, or a different mixture of material. It might be due to erosion where previous sediment has just been cut away, wiped away, so you get a very sharp boundary. It might be, might be removed through mass removal, winnowing, deflation, gullying, something. Or an interface might be created by some other form of disturbance, pits, burrows, features. And if you're in a small trench, you might not be able to distinguish between major removal of sediment and just a boundary between that and a burrow. Interfaces need not be a significant temporal gap. They might be, but they could just be a period where the character of the sediments has changed over, over, over time. Have a look at the sharpness of the contacts of the interfaces. You might find that over two or three centimetres, the character of the sediments change from being silty, uh, silty sand to being a more gritty sand. Uh, or there might actually be a very distinct, almost line in your deposit. And they have different implications. Let's look at, let's look at the issue of surfaces. A, type of, a surface is a type of interface that represents a plane on which sub-aerial processes may have had time to operate and on which repeated activities might have taken place. Um, so if you've got a surface for some time, uh, you might get a lot of rockfall starting to accumulate on it. There may be no change in the rate of rockfall, it's just that rockfall is falling on the one site, the one surface. Uh, there may be um, evidence of bioturbation that relates to that surface or disturbance and treadage that relates to that surface. There may be organic enrichment. Um, if you've got a surface, it's worth having a look at it, uh, not just vertically, but cleaning back the surface, as Mulvaney very nicely did in his excavations at Kintor Cave, where beneath a layer of surface dust, he had a sort of a clay terra rossa unit. I think it's a very good example where um, John, in this case the excavator, has cleared back the surface of, of a layer, in this case a sort of a, an indurated clay layer with a very cracked surface. And I think it's very important um, when you find a, a, a surface to actually clear back part of it so you can get a, a, a look at the surface uh, in three dimensions. It may have root marks, it may have gullying, it may have cracking and mottling. The surface of that layer might be quite informative about the nature of that layer and you can't always see those things just in section. Sometimes you've got to cling back to understand a stratigraphic structure. And surfaces of course have their own dynamics. A conflation of different a palimpsest of different sorts of occupations. Uh, a surface allows for the removal and recycling of material, cultural material. Uh, you might have treadage and, and scuffage associated with the surface uh, and that may disturb stuff for 5 or 10 centimetres immediately below that surface. You might have a concentration of pits and hards dug from this level um, and uh, um, of course you need to be able to identify them and we'll talk more about features but you need to know from what level they were dug. 
And one of the things I find uh, that people often do when they're excavating a site is you, you arrive at a rock shelter and you lay out your grid and then you dig your first spit. Well, it, and, and in that first spit you've included everything that was on the surface of the site. And in fact you've mixed, you've mixed two different units. The stuff on that interface, on that surface of the site, represents often a very different process than the material that's, that's included within the body of the spit. I mean, uh, Schiffer talked about abandonment assemblages. So, uh, when people have, when their traditional uh, hunter-gatherer economy collapsed and people walked off their sites, they may have left their grindstones uh, completely, uh, uh, grindstones that still had usable uh, 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 lives on the site, little caches of material, left useful items around. It was a classic abandonment assemblage. In a normal course of events, that material would have been salvaged, recycled, the grindstones would have been broken, used for grinding bush tobacco, used as abraders for wooden artefacts, and been cleaned and discarded over there. You've got two different sorts of assemblages. You need to keep the stuff on the surface of the site quite separate from the stuff within the first spit. But it's a really interesting example of how people neglect surfaces. Similarly, if you're excavating and you find a sharp interface between two layers and you suspect it's a surface, anything that's sitting on that surface should be treated as an assemblage in its own right, not mixed into the material above or below. Another type of interface is a disconformity. Unlike a surface which might be just a stool stand for some reason, sediment has stopped accumulating for for some reason, and everything is happening on that surface. A disconformity is where, where that interface is created by removal of sediment. Quite, uh, it's quite a, it's a break in time, but it's a break in time where there's been um, um, uh, removal of sediment through erosion uh, or uh, um, uh, some other quite catastrophic uh, event. Okay, this is Aspro Chalico, um, a Paleolithic site in northern Greece. As well as showing the layer cake stratigraphy, what it also shows is there's a major disconformity here between these deposits and these more recent deposits. And the disconformity is marked by flowstone in, in black. Uh, so this is a major, uh, this shows there's been a, a major period when deposit has built up, then been eroded away, and then has built up again against uh, this, um, this bench of older sediment. When I read site reports, and I look at people's radiocarbon carbon dates, and they may have drawn a relatively uniform uh, stratigraphic sequence profile. And here there'll be a date of 5,000, and here there'll be a date of 25,000, separated by only a few centimetres. By definition, by implication, there is a major, there's a, there's a, there's a major interface there somewhere. Either sediment has stopped accumulating for 20,000 years, or sediment has accumulated uh, up to 5,000 years and then we clean back to 20,000 years. People need to resolve that because it, 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 it affects the interpretation of the site. If sediment has been removed, uh, maybe there's a lot of material that's younger than 25,000 years that has dropped down, been left you know, in the top of that older unit. Ed Harris, E.C. Harris, Jed Harris, usefully positioned the interface as a major unit of analysis. And from an archaeological perspective, what happens at an interface is critical. Do we have lags of artefacts? Um, do we have a concentration of occupational material? I want to, I want to draw on a central Australian example, Kulpi Mara Rock Shoulder, a beautiful plus in site, very well excavated by Peter Thorley in central Australia. Kulpi Mara sits at the base of a, quite a large sandstone cliff. Uh, all along the base of this cliff, you have uh, Rock shell is developed through a process called cavernous weathering or basal sapping. It's this classic process whereby moisture is retained at the base of an escarpment and you get a zone of active erosion. And this creates um, a very friable white sand. I mean, the sandstone is very soft, easily eroded. Now, he has a plasticine layer with a veneer of Holocene material on top. And through very careful excavation, he showed that in fact, there was no lag of artefacts um, at the layer interface. So in this case, it didn't seem that we'd had a remove, uh, you know, erosion of fine sediments. You know, what, what creates a major, a major break here between 
a unit dated 5,000 years and a unit dated 25,000 years. He looked very carefully at the interface and there wasn't a concentration or lag of artefacts you'd expected if the fine sediments had built up and then been cut back or eroded. But, but on the other hand, in this location there was no reason for expecting that human use of these rock shoulders would directly switch on or off sediment accumulation. I mean, sediment, these rock shoulders were, were er actively eroding all the way along the escarpment. It was a natural process. So I think here we have, we have an interesting example where probably a third factor is affecting both the accumulation of the layers and the use of, the use of these rock shoulders, whereby perhaps moisture controls the, uh, uh, the degree of erosion and the rate of erosion, but also controls the attractiveness of these rock shoulders for human occupation. So you get periods when you've got active erosion and you've got active occupation, and then you've got periods which are more stable. Humans aren't using the site and nor is it eroding much. You know, and here we need to, you know, just to stress the importance of an interface is we're not going to find lags of artifacts and we're not going to find surfaces if we don't look for them during excavation. So the take home message here is the boundary between your layers, what a layer sits on and the, what, what the surface of the layer is like are as important as the character of the layer itself.